Good evening and welcome to, to tonight's webinar for, for CIS 205 Technology and Integration Support. Tonight we're going to be talking about the basics of client-side virtualization. So let's go ahead and begin. And the first place we're going to begin is the purpose of virtual machines or the purpose of VMs. So what is the main purpose? Well, the main purpose of a VM is to run a virtual desktop from within a physical PC. So basically, you're running a PC within a PC. The host system or the host PC has the responsibility of setting up and managing the virtual machine. Now, VMs can run on almost any operating system. I'm not sure of any desktop operating system that cannot run uh, VMs. Now, your virtual machines can be sandboxed, and that means that they can be isolated. That means that you can run that PC in isolation, and you can do a whole bunch of things with it and not worry about it affecting your network or your host system. You can also take your, your virtual machines and you can network them. That means that you can create your own network on your desktop. And you can connect your virtual machines to your outside network. They are highly versatile and they're becoming more and more common as we move along and technology increases. So what can you use them for? Well, we can use them for learning purposes. You can learn a new operating system before committing to it full time. You can load that operating system onto your PC, learn it, learn how to deal with it before you make the commitment to make it your main operating system. You can also test out configurations before rolling them out to all of the PCs under your control. One of the things that this is good for is if you are a Windows person and you want to learn Linux, when you want to know it, you can load Linux in a VM and you can learn about it without having to repurpose your Windows PC or to build a new PC. You can use VMs for testing. Uh, this is particularly useful if you are in a um, enterprise situation <clears throat> where you need to test an application before you roll it out to a production production PCs, you can test it in the VM. This allows you to test them thoroughly. It's also great for testing patches before you roll them out. You set up a VM so it mirrors your production PCs. You can test the patch and make sure that the patch does not break your production system before you roll it out. Another good thing is there are some applications out there that require an older operating system. They don't run well in modern operating systems. In particular, um, everyone knows that XP is no longer supported by Microsoft, so now you're having to run everything on Windows 7 or Vista, or Windows 8.1, or Windows 8 for that matter. Well, if you have a piece of mission critical legacy application for your environment, well, you don't want to run that, you don't want to run XP on your desktop because it's no longer secure, so you can run XP within a VM and you are more secure and you still get the advantages of having the newer operating system. So now let's move on to one of the critical pieces for virtualization, which is the hypervisor. So what is the hypervisor? Well, the hypervisor is the virtual machine manager. In the application that we're talking about tonight, it is the software that runs on top of the host hardware. We are talking about type 2 
virtual machines tonight. Um, <clears throat> the hypervisor is what actually allocates the resources to the virtual machine. Uh, and it also controls access to other resources, like to your network interface card. The hypervisors that are out there that are free, the major players, uh, the first one is Windows Virtual PC. These, by the way, are all free to download if you don't have them already. Uh, Windows Virtual PC actually comes bundled in Windows 8 and Windows 8.1, but if you have Windows Vista or Windows 7, you can download it from Microsoft and install it. And as long as you have uh, the right op not the right operating system, the right processor and enough RAM, you can run a VM to your heart's enjoyment. Uh, the only thing about Virtual PC, Windows Virtual PC, is that it will only run a 32-bit guest operating system. Another one that's free to download is VMware's VMware Player. This one is not their full feature, but their free version. Uh, you can still run VMs. You can run 32-bit or 64-bit guest operating systems. And if you want the full capabilities that VMware offers, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, same thing goes with VirtualBox. Uh, this one, too, can run 32-bit and 64-bit operating systems. And here's where I get to say <clears throat> I uh, actually made a recording of starting up a virtual machine within a Windows 7 environment, but Blackboard Collaborate does not like um, outside recordings. Couldn't quite figure out how to load it within this webinar. So now let's talk about some of the requirements for a virtual machine. Uh, pretty minimal if you want to run basics, but there are some considerations. The first one is <clears throat> your VMs share your physical resources. With that, what I mean is, is if you have 8 gigabytes of RAM, well, your VMs needs to share that RAM. As a matter of fact, if you're using virtual PC, you need to dedicate a certain amount of your RAM to that machine, which means that you lose it from the system, kind of. You, you actually only lose it while the VM is running. So you need to be aware of how much RAM you have and how much you can afford to share out. Now, VMs can be RAM intensive, so the more RAM you have available to share, the better the experience. Same thing kind of goes along with the processor. Uh, VMs can be processor intensive, especially if you're running a VM with several applications. It's going to consume processing power. So you might want to consider using a higher end multi core processor when you're setting up your host system. They also share your available disk space. So now you have your standard operating system, your host operating system, on your host machine. Now you load a virtual machine, which means that you need to have enough disk space to load the guest operating system. Now that means you're going to need about 20 to 30 gigabytes worth of free space just for the guest operating system, and then whatever files or programs or applications you load on your VM, you need the disk space available. And for some reason, uh, at least in my experience, VMs seem to take more disk space than they should. Um, another consideration is if you're going to use your 
virtual machine to test security, as in you want to see what a virus does, well, then you need to consider how you're going to sandbox or you need to make sure that you do not share your network interface card or your connection to the host system. You need to sandbox it. And different uh, hypervisors do that in different ways, but you need to tell it to sandbox it or else you're going to actually give it access to your host system. Um, if you are going to allow your virtual machine out to the to your network, you need to make sure that your NIC has enough bandwidth to handle both the virtual machine and your normal network traffic. Or you could consider installing another NIC. Uh, one of the things that I will say about uh, client-side virtualization is more and more people are doing it. They're setting up virtual servers. And one second here. Sorry about that. Had a minor distraction. But they are becoming more common and more and more PCs are coming straight from the manufacturer with the resources that will allow an effective virtual machine experience. And guess what? That's all you really need to know about virtual machines from the client side of things for the CompTIA A plus exam. With that, I'm going to end the recording. <laughs>